first off, it's nice to be here. Uh, I remember when I was starting Nexenta years ago, I think the first time I ever spoke in public about it was outside the bar downstairs. They were doing interviews, and Mark Carlson was on the other end of the, of the mic, and uh, so it's kind of nice to be back. Um, different event, but, um, and also back in storage. So I'll tell you a little bit about my journey getting back into storage and getting into containers and storage here, as well as I'll dive into what the heck are we starting to build uh, with open EBS and why people might be interested. Okay. So the, the first point is just, I got to know CloudBite uh, about a year ago. CloudBite has been around for about four and a half, maybe five years. Um, some of the team came from actually NetApp, um, and I was advising a company that one of their investors, Fidelity, uh, is also an investor in. And what I saw when I got to know these guys was, holy smokes, 30 plus storage engineers who have actually you know, fought the fire, right? And, and actually built something that was getting adopted. And so there's a tradi traditional software-defined storage product under the CloudBite uh, brand that's doing fine. And I'm happy to talk to you about that some other time. But today, I'm mainly going to talk to you about open EBS. I'm not sure why we have a robotic mule as a uh, mascot, but we do. It uh, kind of emerged over the last year. Um, and so I'm going to talk to you about containerized storage for containers. And w what do we mean by that? A little bit about myself. As I mentioned, um, I did help uh, found Nexenta many years ago now. There was a startup before that that we sold to Riverbed in the IP communication space. That's the, the lighthouse uh, there. Um, and then after Nexenta, I went and helped found a company called Stackstorm which was in the, is in the DevOps space, although it's been purchased by Brocade. So event-driven automation used by folks like Netflix and uh, WebEx, et cetera. So I kind of got a glimpse of the future, or at least a future, the DevOps world. And now I'm back in storage, and it really is informing my perspective. And you can decide whether it's for better or for worse. But uh, that's just a little bit about myself. I'm fairly recent. I've been uh, uh, involved in the company for almost a year, but I joined as CEO uh, in July. And we're famous on GitHub, at least in our own minds. So I'll just, it's a vanity metric, but we have lots of stars on GitHub. So if, if you were to look at GitHub, you know, which of these projects that does containerized storage has the most stars like uh, OpenEBS does? It's a vanity metric. It's not... Uh, it's not the same thing as, as uh, it's only on 0.4. There's one question I, I want you guys to kind of uh, take away from today. It's what if what's good for the goose is good for the gander? Which is to say, we're all concerned about these new workloads that are showing up. Microservices, container, uh, containerized workloads. What if you actually refactored storage? and made the storage controller a container that rode along with your workloads. What would that look like? Why would you be crazy enough to try to uh, write a new storage stack? And, 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 and really, that ought to be a takeaway question again from this talk. So that's the kind of thing that we have in our head all the time. We think the answer is pretty profound. We think you can solve some problems that we've all faced in storage for time immemorial in a better way uh, using containers. Why not? Why not use Kubernetes? It's there. Why not use microservices? It helps you develop faster um, and it helps you scale in different ways. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about that uh, as well. So um, this is a simplified version of Kubernetes. So any, anyone hacking around on Kubernetes? Uh, yeah, I mean, I just draw it up here to begin to talk about what do we mean by uh, containerized. Uh, as you'll see in the next slide, what we mean is we actually run up in the Kubernetes environment. We do have uh, intelligence that is not in each pod as well. Um, and just, I'll just play fanboy for a second. I'm so 
excited about Kubernetes. I think uh, those of us who have been in storage for years had this idea when we were helping to find software to find that this is it, right? We're actually going to make uh, storage and infrastructure dance to the tune of, of uh, the applications. And then um, it kind of happened, but VMware happened also. And uh, I would argue that we never quite got there with the virtualization approach and with the Uber orchestrator being, um, being VMware. I mean, they, uh, unbelievable technical company. In this case, what we have is an open source Uber orchestrator, right? From arguably the, the world's greatest technology company in history, at least in terms of cranking out cash. Uh, they seem to be a benign uh, uh, leader today. I'm sure there will be times in which they are not. They have put it into the Linux uh, 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 foundation or into Cloud Native Foundation. Linux Foundation is killing it, by the way. I don't know if you guys have noticed this, but this thing has gone from interesting, struggling a little bit to like a $100 million a year business. So uh, this is one reason. Um, so I'm a big Kubernetes fan. And what we've done with OpenEBS is, just as I uh, alluded to, we, we have a controller in each pod. Um, those controllers then do things like access physical disks, should you happen to have disks in that, uh, in that uh, hardware, um, local and remote, serves them up as block today. So today it's block only. Uh, we do some limited QoS control. And again, we're on 0.4. So hopefully you can take a look at the GitHub and say, why aren't you doing this? Engage with the community. Give us ideas in terms of roadmap, OK? Um, and then we have a brain. We're coming up with a better name for it, but that gives us our unified API that is sitting there running on the master um, and, and delivers APIs and storage scheduler and then some other capabilities. So high level, this is, this is what it is. I'm now going to take kind of a divergence, and, and I'm going to talk about some users we've been talking to and that you can see that are quite prominent in the Kubernetes community. And what are they doing with storage, or what are they... What are they not doing with storage? Um, then I'm going to come back and give you kind of a pseudo demo, right? It's going to be a PowerPoint demo, but it's going to be, OK, you're deploying this. What exactly is OpenEBS doing, and how is it getting its instructions? OK? So allow me this uh, divergence. So when I came back into storage um, this year, really, in the last year, I, I noticed this trend, which I also saw in the DevOps world, which is, a lot of big users saying, storage, uh, no thanks. Yeah, that's all right. We're, we're figuring it out. We're used as. It's kind of embarrassing, I would say. Um, and I think we as storage folks kind of ought to own it. Like, what is going on that big users, folks on Kubernetes, or uh, some of this data like this one is from the Cassandra show last year. So I'm not you know, exposing anything that's not publicly available. Um, what's going on that they've decided to go with DAS? DAS, really? Yes, there's some benefits to DAS that we all know about, and I'll, I'll talk more about. But obviously, there's some downsides to DAS as well. Um, and, and what we're seeing is that they're just, there's so much frustration, and I'll, d I'll dive into this a little bit more in a second, um, around complex scale-out storage in particular, that uh, operators are moving towards DAS, and that is uh, pretty amazing. One of the things that DAS does give you is some predictability. I mean, this box is going to behave in this way, right? You, if you sell me something that scales across n boxes, well, then it depends on the workload. What's my working set? What is my cache hit ratio? What is, you're going to have less variability around performance uh, with DAS, right? Um, you're going to have less multiple layers of who deals with resiliency. Well, in this case, it's sure as shit not your storage, right? It's got to be upstream, right? And in a world in which you know, one of our big users at Stackstorm was Netflix, in a world in which our automation software was competing with their automation software that was killing their own processes, Chaos Monkey, right? There's actually a, a real thought that less is more. Let's not try to have storage that deals with resiliency. Let's just do it up uh, at the application level. Let's force our development teams to own the resilience problem. So there's some of that going on uh, as well. 
I personally think it's, uh, it's crazy uh, at some level, uh, but I'm a, I'm a bit of a storage guy. Um, you can't do cross cloud. There's other uh, drawbacks as well. And then distributed. I mean, you do get centralized management. You do get greater efficiency, right? You're actually sharing uh, resources across N hosts. That's great. You have data protection and so forth. Uh, but again, we're seeing some big users just say, no thanks. And this is my existential dread. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, what is going on? What, how is this possible? that the state of storage has gotten to the point that some of our most technically respected users of next-gen architectures are saying, thanks, but no thanks. You can find Homer Simpson doing just about everything on the web, by the way, uh, including, <laughs> yeah. But DAS, I mean, I don't have to sell this to this team, right? I mean, you guys know, why do we use storage, not DAS? I mean, it is, a, it is uh, you're, you're, you're going to, you're going to burn a lot of trees, right? Or wherever you want to, however you want to put it. It's not good for the environment. You're going to underutilize your hardware. You're going to use up data center space. It's really hard to support workload mobility. But if you look at Kubernetes and the DAS project on Kubernetes, I mean, it's getting traction. This isn't a speculative thing, right? This is actually really happening. So there's some attempts to enable some level of workload mobility, even across DAS. But we think it's harder, a lot harder. Uh, than, than obviously than what we're doing, for example, or for that matter, than uh, scale out. Our CTO just had a blog this morning, I think, and we're calling Yaz, yet another scale, or bang Yaz, not yet another scale out storage system. Really don't think, and it's not for me to say, again, look at the users, really don't think that another, maybe rewritten uh, for the nth time, scale out storage system is the answer for these use cases. There are some freaking amazing stuff happening at the file level where people are seeming to uh, stretch the cap theorem and, and, and I wouldn't put it past them. But scale out storage has some known issues, right? It's not particularly tunable for containers and you're not really gonna run your scale out cluster in a container, at least not efficiently. Latency. Um, what are we actually after? Are we after throughput, you know, cheap capacity, IOPS? Well, often a lot of workloads, including some of the folks that were on that uh, slide before, they're after low latency. And uh, yeah, DAS will beat the shit out of <laughs> these things in terms of low latency. That's just a reality. And it's even getting to be more the case as you have better and better hardware, right? So a big scale out uh, storage system uh, can actually get in the way of performance. There's actually a pretty cool, um, well, it just basically says what I said, but uh, there's an article uh, yesterday, I think, where, where the scale computing CEO is talking about how controllers get in the way. So it's kind of in the water now, this observation. Um, and then, you know, when we were getting StackStorm going, if any of you remember that, it was no more lock-in. This is ridiculous, right? We've got to... Uh, generally speaking, scale out storage systems mean you have uh, more lock in, not less, and it makes it hard to do cross cloud. It's not trivial to run your cluster locally and remotely. Um, you're having to do sync ups, uh, metadata, et cetera. It's very hard, uh, not clear, it's totally possible to run a distributed cluster where you're on prem and off prem. And it's a mess, sorry, it's a mess. It's a mess. If you look at the applications that our users that we want to serve are running, and then you show them, hey, and here's my you know, uh, PhD paper, uh, uh, what do you think about the architecture? They're gonna look at it like, really? No thanks, I'll go back to DAS. Uh, these are older systems are not architected in a microservices way, and it makes a big difference when you're trying to support stuff at scale, right? A big difference. If, you, if I can fix just a little service, in open EBS and have that reinstantiated via the magic of containers, that is so much easier for me. I get a lot of stuff for free by being uh, natively microservices. And then last but not least, <laughs> uh, any Dr. Strangelove fans? In the, this is, okay, right? 
possibly bad taste given North Korea, but um, I mean the blast radius. And I remember at the Open Storage Summit in, I think, Amsterdam or wherever, uh, Randy Bias, who many of you guys know, getting up there and saying, yeah, the problem with storage is the blast radius. Yeah, you're, you're going to put petabytes of my data in something that could go wrong. Uh, no thanks. And this is a real concern. This is a real concern for folks. Now, of course, their Cassandra could go wrong as well. So to me, it's more the matter of blast radiuses here and here. So another takeaway is or, or we're really going to go hard at, look, we don't need yet another scale-out storage system. So what, what is a, another approach? We're calling it container-attached storage, just because you have to summarize all things in three-letter acronyms, but uh, CAS. Um, and the idea is just enough storage services around your DAS to uh, basically to save your butt uh, when things do go awry, um, to get you the performance that you need uh, through some intelligent caching, um, and, and to get the kind of efficiency that you need. Or maybe they don't need it, but they should want it in terms of data center footprint uh, as well. So, yeah, it's, does it have some distributed capabilities? Yeah, I mean, the master controller is essentially dealing with some scheduling, um, and that's how it is, but it's not in the write path or the read path. You're behaving like it's DAS, but you're getting a lot of the benefits of uh, scale out. We could have also called it like just enough, I don't know, storage or JEOS or something like that. So again, I'm going to show you some of it. So this is just as this is a slide. Um, my iTunes is trying to. Uh, yeah. So what do you? This is the last Homer uh, GIF. I promise. Um, so tunable per container. Why is that a big deal? I'm going to show you on the next couple slides. And, but part of it is there's more workloads. They're varying more. They have short duration. Like when I say more, like a load more, thousands of workloads. And you can't, a uh, human, I think, cannot tune well for those workloads. I think being uh, having a controller down at the pod level um, so that it can actually hit that workload's needs is really important. It doesn't solve the whole human storage engineering piece yet, um, but at least gets you down you know, sort of from, hey, we're, we're, we're going into the cavity to, no, no, we're working on the left ventricle. There, there's, you're much more granular in the storage policies you can set. Cross-cloud portability, one of those things you kind of get for free uh, when you're running on, on, on Docker. You can use uh, legacy SAN underneath, and you can uh, deliver lower latency, and you shouldn't have special skills needed. It should behave. The goal, our goal, and we're not the only ones doing this, um, is to behave in a way that other containerized applications behave to the extent possible. So now I'll just hit, why is microservice granular? So this is uh, our, my former CTO's blog, Alex, who's now a um, storage architect at N NVIDIA. But he was just talking about, let's have a rational set. How, how do you guys tune your workloads? I mean, this seems fairly reasonable. You have maybe 10 parameters you want to run through. The reality is you say, no, no, never. Out of the 237 set parameters, there's only two you ever touch, right? I mean, that's, that's reality. But let's say you are being scientific. I'm going to touch 10. And uh, let's say they're not continuous. Let's say there's you know, only zero to, zero to three, right? I'm going to test a handful of workloads. It's going to take me 10 minutes. How long is this going to take? Anyone? Days, hours, days, years, yeah, roughly 6,000 years. So we've kind of been bullshitting our users, is the reality, right? We've been saying, hey, we give you the, we give you the tunables. We give, you can tune it however you want. And uh, that's great. We give you so much tunables that it's literally intractable for you to come up with an optimal solution in your lifetime. And that, that is reality in the storage industry. So when you're wondering, like, why are people throwing the baby out with the bathwater? Why are people saying, no thanks, no storage, I'll go DAS? It's because they've dug into these things and said, you know what? The state of the world is 
we don't freaking know how to optimize these systems. We simply uh, don't. We have some best practices, and I have a lot of respect for people who have figured it out the hard way. But in a world in which, uh, I mean, a containerized world, in which your workloads are now not, I don't know what an average life of a VM is, you know, weeks. It could be minutes or an hour for a container. So in which you have many more workloads changing much more rapidly, I would just assert that the idea of you're going to go off and do uh, storage engineering once and figure it out is, is just not, not true. It's not happening. We don't really solve that. <laughs> but what we do uh, is we give you that granularity of control down to the per, per workload. And then that should be able to set you up for kind of a good feedback loop. Without talking a roadmap too much, but that, that's, that's our vision. So I'm pounding through, but I, um, we will have some good time for questions, I think, at the end. What I want to do um, quickly is kind of just show an example, just so it, it sinks in. I think you guys are, are getting um, what we're trying to do. And, uh, and then we can talk again about you know, the pluses and minuses. And that's really what I have left to talk about, if that sounds good. So in this case, this is just an example of a Cassandra workload. Seems to be one that we're all talking about. There's a lot of, by the way, if you put this up in front of a Cassandra administrator, they're saying, you know, no freaking way or yes, please. I mean, there's a lot of debates about whether you want your storage to do any replicas, right? There may still be a real use case for your storage, even if you're not doing sync copies. I grabbed uh, two in this case. So what you might have is Cassandra doing a couple and us doing a couple, or, uh, or other you know, similar system like us. And so the, 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 the first point, which I probably haven't stressed enough, but if you've been hacking around on Kubernetes, you know this. All of this is not input you know, by a person. right? It's a storage policy. And then you have, when you provision uh, Cassandra, you might have Cassandra policy A. That picks up some YAML. Um, and this is just uh, made to work. So you're, you will have engineers who are thinking like, you know, that shouldn't be our storage policy, but they figure it out once and put it into the system. All of that is provisioned. It's not because of us per se, but anyone who's integrated upstream into Kubernetes, all that, uh, all that provisioning is done for you, you know, for free. So in this case, we're writing uh, locally, uh, we're doing some rebalancing and background based on your desire to, let's say, not be more than 50% locked into cloud A or B. And, and then, and then you know, that, that's, that's kind of that uh, quick use case. What does it get you? Um, I don't know. I, I get pretty geeked just about the idea of being able to run this across your local and remote infrastructure and it's literally the same controllers, and being able to follow your workload into the cloud. That's, that, to me, is quite cool. And why wouldn't you do it if you can? And you can. You can. You, uh, you do have to refactor the whole storage stack, which is a bit of a pain in the ass. In our case, we're putting everything up into user space. And you think you can think about why you would want to do that in today's day and age. Um, but it, it's necessary for containerization. Uh, as well. So you should get uh, faster performance than if you did it, uh, certainly than uh, network attached. And under certain failure scenarios, not all failure scenarios, you're going to avoid a Cassandra rebalancing, which is a lot of work um, and uh, tends to page you uh, when your Netflix uses uh, Stackstorm in part for care and feeding of their Cassandra environment. So I have some second hand, to be fair. Never been on call at Netflix, but a lot of our users have. So Cassandra does amazing stuff, but it's still a total pain in the ass when it says, hey, I'm rebalancing now. That is a wake, wake people up, watch the Cassandra, make sure we're not going to lose metadata on where you are in your Netflix viewing. Uh, and then obviously a happier CFO uh, or whoever it is watching the numbers. I do think there's a real fear that cloud is the new lock-in. And um, 
it's not the only lock-in, obviously, um, but being able to, behind the scenes, rebalance and make sure not all of your data is up in a cloud. You still have physics, you still have data gravity, but if you can intentionally, as part of your storage policy, say, I only want to get this much exposed to each cloud, that, that should help you um, and help you achieve more of a multi-cloud approach. Uh, and then obviously you should get a greater utilization than DAS. Um, we get asked this sometimes. I mean, Kubernetes, if you're following the SIG, the storage SIG, or uh, 1.7, or stuff happening in Kubernetes, I mean, the good news is it is a big wave. The bad news is if you're a little project like us, that can be a little daunting, right? It's like surfing at Mavericks. It's, it is a big wave, and it is moving fast. Um, so they are, not, they are adding some what you would think of as storage capabilities to Kubernetes itself. Um, but there is a lot that is just not in there and that we think is uh, out of scope or has been defined as out of scope for Kubernetes thus far, right? Things like uh, wrestling with uh, QoS, things like policy-based uh, snapshots for backups, uh, th things of that nature. So Kubernetes will get more and more storage intelligence. We, st we still think that there's always going to be space for storage and for intelligent storage. I don't have a landscape slide on here, uh, and I think that's sort of a omission, a uh, mistake. Um, what I would say is that every storage vendor, I mean, it's much like when software-defined storage became a thing, and then in the course of, you know, we probably went a year of everyone saying, well, that seems like a stupid idea, and then within a week or two, everyone said, well, we do it too. Actually, we do that. We've been doing that all along. So container storage for containers, same thing's happening. Everyone is saying, oh, we do storage for containers. We do it via plugins, traditionally is how it's done. You do it via plugins. You basically make that st uh, pod that has stateful workloads, the workloads we care about, databases, et cetera, make it behave more like a pet than cattle. And then we can do a great job delivering storage for it. So. Um, what we're doing and what others who are taking more of a container native approach are trying to do is we're trying to say, no, no, don't treat your, sorry, I, I use this analogy in, uh, with my team in India and I'm like, this is a stupid analogy, but don't treat your cattle like pets, right? Go ahead and uh, treat your stateful workloads much like you treat your stateless workloads. Uh, sleep at night knowing that you've got a storage pod, a storage controller in that pod that can take care of it. But the traditional approach is, hey, wire down those stateful workloads. And then your legacy storage will work pretty well, which is, which is one approach, right? Um, again, you can see why uh, a lot of users are saying, uh, no, no thanks. My big <laughs> mission this is, this is the kind of leadership I give the team. It's not all that useful, but uh, I, I really, if, when you're in these environments, I mean, when we were building Accenta, right, our persona, the persona of the user was a storage administrator. When you're in the newer environments, the personas are developers on the one hand and what we call DevOps architects or operators on the other. They don't want to be storage engineers, right? And if it starts to be a pain, they will walk away They'll go DAS or they'll lock themselves into, you know, EBS on Amazon, right? So you, you, you can't burden them with storage engineering problems, in my opinion. So we really want it to behave like other services provided in a microservice uh, environment. So to, to sum up, and I've got one more kind of ask of you after this slide. But to sum up, and this is probably the wordiest, ugliest slide, but it has a little bit more depth on what we're actually doing. Um, but of course, it is open source, open EBS. I don't know if I mentioned that, but it is open source. Uh, hence the stars on GitHub. Check it out. Take a look. Tell us that our roadmap is good or bad or you know, uh, what's wrong with it. Um, but some of the benefits are, again, granularity. You can follow your workload around and you can set truly poor workload policies. So um, that's, that's a huge benefit, both in terms of manage, but, but also in terms of the 
I.O. blender, to use an old storage cliche, but um, by being able to set even your performance requirements down and having some intelligent caching, you're going to get better performance where you need it. We do some cool stuff around metadata that you can find uh, in, 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 the, um, in the community as well, in, o in OpenEBS, in the repository. Um, the short of it is we're looking at uh, volume, not number of volumes for metadata. So we're also kind of refactoring how you do metadata, which, as we all know, can be uh, a bottleneck, big time bottleneck in storage. And then blast radius, much smaller blast radius. You're talking about um, a handful of locations uh, for your data, um, if that, and uh, everything, the default being move the data behind the scenes so you get local reads and writes. Anyone know what Conway's law is? This is like one of these, like, I'm a DevOps geek thing, so I use the term Conway's law. Yeah, yeah. I mean. It's actually pretty, I think it's profound uh, sometimes. But the basic notion is that your, organ well, correct me, but the basic notion is that your organization will um, come to resemble your IT architecture and vice versa, right? So if you run your teams in silos, guess what? You know, you're gonna have kind of siloed architecture. Um, wh why does this unlock innovation? Well, if you're going to a microservices architecture, that means I can have, you know, one pizza teams doing my replication, doing this, doing my caching, doing my uh, ZFS work. There is some ZFSness uh, happening, all of that. And they're not tightly coupled, thanks to the architecture. And that is a lot better because tight, I mean, dealing with tightly coupled engineering teams, I've done it, lived it, it doesn't really work, <laughs> is the short of it. There's a reason why DevOps environments are 10, 100 times more productive than the rest of us who have been doing more waterfall-like development. So Conway's Law, we have a built-in advantage because we've embraced microservices and how we build stuff. And, and we're not the only ones doing it. My parting thoughts are, um, help, help me out. You, you may not like the mule, which is open EBS's, uh, it's a robotic mule. I don't know, you may not like us. Maybe it's some other containerized uh, storage solution out there. Um, but I think you would agree that what we're talking about is cloud native. Um, you know, let's resist uh, cloud washing or cloud native washing or container washing because sure as shit it is happening. And just because you integrate with Kubernetes does not mean you're cloud native. It doesn't. I'm sorry. It just doesn't. And it may be better. Maybe we're wrong. May maybe the plug-in approach slow down your containers, treat them more like pets, not cattle. Maybe that's the right approach. Maybe that wins. Um, I'll take that bet. The bet we're making is that, no, truly being cloud native, refactoring your controllers themselves, running them as containers is the right way uh, to go. So get started with uh, OpenEBS. I mean, it uh, couldn't be much harder. This is another thing you just get for free, right? How hard is it to try it out? Like if you, well, first off, you have to have Kubernetes. So that's, that's, that can be, you know, non-trivial in and of itself. Um, and we will support other orchestrators in the future, of course. Um, but once you do, because we're upstream, uh, we have an operator uh, in, in the Kubernetes uh, itself. It's like two lines of YAML. Go have fun, try it out. Try it on your laptop, try it on a little cloud, uh, whatever your Kubernetes environment is. And again, start treating storage um, like a first class citizen of this container native, uh, cloud native world. So that's what I've got. And with that, I do have time for, um, I do have time for questions. Let me give you some, oops, let me give you some uh, coordinates uh, to find us. It is a community. Again, we're on 0.4. We're a ways away from saying, hey, you know, run this in production or open EBS, although people are running it in production, but that's okay. Uh, but really, towards the end of the year is when we'll probably feel comfortable with folks running it in production. We have a big uh, bunch of our users and others coming to KubeCon 
in Austin. So that that will be uh, that'll be a big moment for us. But what we need is any feedback, uh, insights. You know, ha have at it. It's a vibrant community, but we need more folks. Why I'm talking here is who really understand storage well. So hope hope you guys. And we are, I have to say it, but it's true, we are hiring uh, as well. Okay? Questions? Or applause, you guys can just say. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so what you're expected to hear, is it um, too high level or too, uh, assumes too much about Kubernetes or Questions? Please. What do you see as competition for this technology? In. Yeah. Yep. Um, so again, I sort of set up. Okay, Daz is an alternative. People don't know, but, but but you're asking more. So the more direct answer is probably Portworks. So they've gotten. Um, they're running at GE. Um, they're taking a different approach. They're taking a similar approach, put it that way. It's slightly different uh, in, in terms of implementation. They're more proprietary, but there's open source pieces as well. So that would be a key one. There's one that's maybe a little earlier called Storage OS. Has a good, uh, a good team uh, as well. Yeah. So those would be a couple. Uh, and then there's Rook, which I almost don't um, which is basically containerizing Ceph. So in terms of stars on GitHub, it's, we, I think we recently passed Rook, but they're, they're the one getting the community mentality, uh, mind share, other than us, yeah. Yes? Yep. Um, sure. So. When you deploy a pod, right, or an application on, on Kubernetes, um, the storage policy uh, that will invoke us will actually put the controller sitting there, right? And this enables us to, uh, to look local, and it really is on a per, truly a per pod uh, basis. So, yeah, really the abstraction is pod, and we're saying per application, but it's per pod. Yes. Um, we we have some folks in the community uh, doing some stuff with um, Nomad is one I know um, and Mesos, but they're just not as far along right now as Kubernetes. But certainly the goal would be yes. Yeah. Too much Homer Simpson, or about the right level of Homer Simpson. <laughs> All right. Well, that's it. look. It's great to be back at some level uh, here. I see some familiar faces in the room, so uh, you know, reach out to me however you want to, or I'll reach out to you. But I'd love to chat further about this, and really appreciate you guys uh, coming. So thank you. <laughs>